Today will be my second sermon I will be preaching on in Jude's work. I've titled the sermon today, uh, The Objective of Jude's Letter. If you remember last week, I preached on verse 1 through 2, which is essentially the salutation of Jude. So today I, ta- I plan, by God's grace and Lord willing, to preach on the purpose of his letter or the objective of his letter. And that is the topic of my sermon today. And I ask that you would keep your Bible turned open because I plan to just speak um, on verse 3 through 4 or provide an expositional or verse-by-verse commentary over these two verses. So if I can draw your attention now to verse 3 and 4 and then ask you to keep your Bible turned open because my plan today is to spend an hour just addressing these two verses. God's Word says, starting in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we pray you will protect us from false teachers. Lord, by your grace and by your mercy, we rejoice, Lord, that you have revealed us into truth. Pray, Lord, that you will enable us, Lord, and and the Holy Ghost will indwell in us to speak boldly against any doctrine that opposes the doctrine of Christ. We rejoice, Lord, in the, in the truth that we, we have just read, and we pray that we will meditate on it, and we will reflect on the, these words. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. So again, if you please keep your Bible turned open, I'd like to provide a, a verse-by-verse commentary over these two verses. At the beginning of Jude's letter, We remember he gave his opening salutation, but notice that what the first thing he says at the beginning of verse three, he uses the word beloved. Now this word beloved is is a beautiful word because it's actually in the vocative case. If you don't know what a vocative case, it's easy to remember because just remember what your cases are. The moment you can remember what cases are, then it'll help you understand the context or what the author was intending for us to know. So think about what cases are in grammar. You have your nominative, which is basically your subject, your accusative, which is your object, your genitive, which is basically possession, your dative, which is an indirect object. But if something is in the vocative case, it is what we would call the case of address. Therefore, we see here Jude is addressing his audience. He is literally directing his attention to them. And he's saying, beloved. And the word beloved is not something uncommon in the Bible. In fact, you'll see how the Apostle Paul used this word also. If you remember in Paul's epistle to the Romans, he opened up, I believe in verse 7 of chapter 1. He said, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. So the emphasis on beloved is nothing new in the Bible. Now, Jude stressed this word or highlighted beloved because he knows his audience belongs to God. He knows that they were purchased with the price and he knows the Holy Ghost indwells inside of them. So by him calling them beloved is beautiful because it's basically his way of saying I am devoted to God. He's saying, I am devoted to God's people. But most importantly, I'm devoted to the gospel. And there is no compromise in this letter that I write unto you. God's people. Now, you have to remember something about this word beloved. It's a beautiful word, but like any gift that God gives us or any word in the Bible, they can easily be abused. For example, the word brother or the word beloved, or even if someone says, I love you, 
People can abuse these words. For example, you never find today when you meet someone for the very first time, they say, brother, in the context of Christianity, that really troubles me. I don't like it personally if I meet someone for the first time and they call me brother, especially if you have no clue what I believe. I'm not going to call someone I meet for the first time brother because that would imply that they affirm the same gospel. Second, the same thing with beloved or the word, the words, I love you. You want to make sure you use these in context. A Christian takes these words and embraces them in context. You don't abuse them. Okay, if you're abusing them, then you're just a flatterer. You don't want to be a flatterer. You want to be a Christian. A Christian recognizes how the Bible says, beloved, and he's talking about God's people, those that were purchased with the price, those whose salvation has been infallibly secured. You don't want to be a people pleaser. Okay, Paul gave the warning. Why? In Galatians 1. Paul said, do I seek to please men or do I seek to please God? For if I sought to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. So again, he didn't abuse these words and neither should we. Address it in context towards people that do have a credible profession in the true gospel. And then when he says, beloved, then he goes into the message. When I gave all diligence. Now pause here for a moment. Notice the participle he uses. When I gave all diligence. Now, I promise you this. If you read commentaries, if you study scholars and their work on Jude, I promise you this. There is a, a never-ending debate on whether or not we should interpret the participle when I gave as a temporal or a concessive participle. Now, let me explain to you what that means. Some of you may have never heard that before, and that's fine. But I'll explain to you what this means. If you were to interpret it as temporal, then you would have to translate this clause as while I gave all diligence. But if you were to interpret it as a concessive participle, then that means you would have to interpret it as although I was giving all diligence. So that's the distinction between um, temporal and concessive. When you read the passage and it says, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Now, what's the difference? Some people say, well, what does this really mean? Well, I'll explain to you the difference and I'll provide you a definition for a concessive participle. And trust me in my sermon, I'm going to make it known to you why there's a specific position you need to take when you're interpreting this passage or this clause. When he says, when I gave all diligence. If you were to take the position and say, while I gave all diligence to write unto you, let me tell you the problems with that. And there was a scholar by the name of Dr. Thomas. I disagree with a lot of this guy's work, but he made a really good point in his explanation. He said, and I'm just paraphrasing, he said, if you were to take the position while I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, which is a temporal participle, he said that would imply that Jude was not hindered in his letter of salvation by the, the intruders because the very letter we have is the very letter he intended to write. That's what it would mean if you say, while I gave all diligence to write unto you. But I don't believe that's what he meant. And I'll tell you why. I believe based on the grammar of when I gave all diligence to write unto you that this is what he had intended to write, but then he had to modify his plan. And you know why I say that? Look at what he says right after he says, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Look what he immediately says afterwards. It was needful. He used an indicative verb there, which is a statement of fact. And then he followed it with the noun, needful. It was needful. So this clearly indicates, as Dr. Thomas made a good point, a change of plans. So the point is, Jude wanted to write a letter to God's people about the salvation we all share. He wanted to write about the very gospel that saved him, that saved them also. But clearly he had to modify due to the intrusion of the false teachers that crept into the church to spread damnable heresies, to lead God's people away. So, 
Regarding this concessive participle, let me give you a definition for it. So I've given you an example of what a concessive participle is. It basically means although I gave or although I was giving all diligence to write unto you is essentially how you want to translate it. Some people today have a problem with that translation because they say, although it's not in the Greek text, but they're failing to realize that's the force of the participle. That's the force of the participles. Why we interpret it because of the force of the participle. And I'll explain to you what a concessive participle is and how you are to define it. I was reading um, the Greek grammar beyond the basics, and I'm just going to paraphrase some of the arguments. But I'll make it as simple as possible because I don't want you to be confused. I don't want it to be overcomplicated. And I'm not going to beat a dead horse, so to speak, about this point. But essentially, a concessive participle, according to the Greek grammar beyond the basics, is essentially a concessive participle that implies that the state or the action of the main verb is true in spite of the state of the or the action of the participle. So in other words, it takes the force of although, and this is commonly used in the Bible. And I think that is a great explanation, especially since when you read the text. Again, the fact that he says, when I gave all diligence, however, it was needful. We clearly see the change of plans. And I'm going to show you guys in this sermon, a few, about maybe 10 or 15 minutes more, Lord willing, several other reasons why I take this position as well, but I'm going to get to that point. But notice what he writes to them. His initial intent was to write to God's people. And he says, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. This is what he initially or intended to write. Now, let me give you an important disclaimer here because I don't want you to walk away perplexed as to what this means, common salvation. And I want to warn you, there is a very popular heresy out there today called common grace. Now, let me tell you what common grace is. It's a position that's typically held today by many what I call compromising Calvinists. You'll find compromising Calvinists in some sovereign grace churches. You'll find them in landmark Baptists. You'll find them in primitive Baptists. You'll find them in reformed Baptists. You'll find them in Presbyterians. I'm not painting a broad brush towards everybody. I'm simply saying they exist. And I'm telling you, a lot of people hold to this view. Well, here's what these people are going to say. These are people that claim to be Calvinists, so to speak. In person, I could care less about that label. I don't use the label anymore either. <coughs> but they're going to say this. They're going to say that while God does give grace to the elect, and that grace is salvific, that grace is efficacious, that grace is, is irresistible. Those are the arguments that these people are going to say. Okay, however, they're going to come up with this common grace notion where they're going to say, yes, but God also gives grace to all men without exception. And they're going to say, but it's a non-saving type of grace. So in other words, they define common grace as a universal non-saving grace. Ladies and gentlemen. Common grace is heresy. There is no such thing as common grace in the Bible. And that's not what he means here in the text when he says common salvation. Not the same thing. Okay, do not be confused by this. When he talks about common salvation, let me tell you what that means. I was reading the BDAG lexicon, which is an exhaustive Greek lexicon that's, that's pretty thick. And it's definitely updated. And I will tell you this. In this lexicon, it defines the word common in this context of Jude as simply meaning a common interest or what's shared collectively. Again, we're in Jude for our sermon text today and specifically in Jude 1 verse 3 when he says, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Common in this context refers to a common interest or what's shared collectively. So what does that mean? It simply means, what do believers have in common with regards to the gospel? That's simply what it means. 
So for example, here's one thing that we all share collectively as believers. If you are truly an elect of God, you'll understand common salvation. You know why? Because that simply means that we hold to the same doctrine of election because we believe in the same Father who unconditionally chose us in eternity and thus loves us. That's something we have in common. For example, remember what the Apostle Paul taught us in Romans when he says that we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his eternal purpose, to those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he may be the firstborn among many brethren, to those who he foreknew, he predestined. To be predestined to them, he called. To be called to them, he justified. To be justified to them, he glorified. I tell you what else regarding this common salvation that's mentioned in Jude 1 3. It's a mutual interest to share collectively. Guess what? Because we believe in the same gospel of Christ. And we believe in the same Christ who actually has clothed us in the garments of salvation and covered us in the robe of righteousness. We believe in the same Christ who died for his elect and fallibly secured their salvation and accomplished justification and redemption and reconciliation in their place. This is what we have in common. And additionally, here's what else we share collectively is that we believe in the same Holy Ghost who has spiritually circumcised our hearts, who has testified that we are the children of God, who has bear witness that we are the children of God, who brings to remembrance all things which Christ has taught, who testifies of Christ, who intercedes on our behalf, and who also, again, makes it known or cries out uh, to us that we are God's particular people. This is what we have in common. And again, this word is nothing new in the Bible. I can promise you that. It's not the first time you're going to read in the Bible where it talks about the common salvation. In other places, the text, I believe, is going to say common faith. For example, like if you look at Titus 1.4. Titus 1.4, if you remember how the Bible says, to my son, or to Titus, my son in the common faith. Remember when the Bible says that in Titus 1.4? To Titus, my son in the common faith. So again, this is what he intended to write. The whole, fo- the whole point of his letter was supposed to be about the doctrine of salvation or the good news that all believers embrace. This is what he intended to write, but clearly there was a change of plan. And here's how I know. Look at in your text in verse three, where he says, it was needful. Now, right here, we have to pause for a moment because he says it was needful. This clearly shows there was a change of plans. For example, remember what I said before, you have the indicative verb, it was, followed by the noun, needful. It was needful. So here we see that Jude is basically saying he was compelled or inspired by the Holy Ghost to have a change of plans in the letter. This is clearly proof that there was a change of plans. And you know how I know the emphasis here of it was needful shows that he was compelled or indwelled by the power of the Holy Ghost to change his plans from what he initially intended to write? I'll tell you why. Underline that word needful in your Bible if you feel so led, where it says it was needful. And I'll tell you why. Because you know that that same Greek root word is also used by Paul in 1 Corinthians. I'll explain to you in what manner Paul used it. Do you remember in the Bible when Paul said, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. That's 1 Corinthians 9.16. Remember when Paul said, for it was uh, necessity was laid upon me? Same Greek root word that's also used right here in Jude 3 when he says it was needful. So this is proof he was compelled to change his letter. That's the point. 
He initially wanted to write a letter about the gospel that all believers embrace, but here he had to modify his plans. I'll, I'll share with you an additional reason to bolster the argument that I make right now. Look what he says right after he says, it was needful for me to write. To write. You have to underline when he says to write. He says it twice. Now here you have what's called an infinitive verb. I'll explain to you what an infinitive verb. It's basically a verb if you just add to it. To, to. Okay, so instead of, instead of saying right, say to write. That's an infinitive verb. Okay, to write. Notice how he initially said, when I gave all diligence to write. That's the first time he said it. To, to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write. He says it twice. Now, why is this important to highlight this? Okay, grammatically, they're both a little different. The first time he said to write, this right here is what you would call a present infinitive. And the second one, when he said, it was needful for me to write, that is what you would call an aorist infinitive. Now, what's the difference? Simply the same point I have been emphasizing this entire sermon. The first time he said to write basically means this is what he intended to write. This is what he wanted to write. But the second time he said to write, it was needful for me to write. This shows what he actually wrote because of the change of plans. You see why it's important to take that, that participle, when I gave, as a concessive participle. So in other words, when you translate it, you want to translate it as, although I gave all diligence to write unto you, because of that modification. Okay? So that's the point that I wanted to draw across to you, okay? Now let's put an emphasis here on what he actually was forced to write due to the intrusion of the false teachers. Again, if you're looking at your Bible, Jude verse 3. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, Jude 3. Now here... We see what he was forced to write. We see there were the change of plans. He now had to write to the church and plead with them to urge them strongly to contend for the gospel or the essentials of the gospel that has long been declared to them. Now, let me provide some commentary on this. That word exhort is a big deal. Exhort means that Jude was not silence or silent in the face of evil. Jude was somebody who spoke up at the right time because of the nature of these false teachers and their deviant practices. Now, let me give you an illustration of why this is important. This word that's used here for exhorting and exhorted you, or it gave, or it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you. This word is important because, again, I was looking at the B Dag lexicon and it means or indicates to urge strongly. Remember this illustration, I always tell people, when you deal with the context of false teachers, the same love that you have for your children is the same love you should also have for other brothers and sisters in Christ when it comes to gospel essentials. For example, take a look at a son and a daughter today. If, if some of you all today had a son that was older, and let's say the son had a business, and you knew people brought cash daily. You'd want him, of course, to have a highlighter. You could mark the bill to make sure it wasn't a counterfeit. You'd hope that he was at least trained to, to look it up in the light to make sure it wasn't an imposter. And the reason why is because you don't want your child to be cheated. In fact, I would argue that most parents, if they found somebody that was trying to rob their son, they would be the most vocal. They're trying to cheat you. They're trying to rob you. But today, when it comes down to the gospel, people are just like, oh, well, that's just what makes them happy. It's what they want. It's just what they're accustomed to. Let's not judge. Judge not. Let's not be judged, right? Same thing with, let's say you could use the same context as a young lady. I promise you right now, if you guys had a daughter that was older and she met a man and she wanted to marry this man, I can almost rest assured right now, if you did your research on the young man and you found out he was abusive, he was aggressive, 
If you found out he was not the right person for your daughter, you would be the first person to say, leave him now before it's too late. But when it comes down to the gospel, it comes down where they attend church. Well, it makes them happy. They have friends there. They have music they like. They have friends their age. You see today why people are so vexed over this issue? But I tell them, if you just keep your eyes fixed on the gospel, you'll see here that nowhere in the Bible does it permit people to attend this, these false gospel assemblies. Here, Jude is urging them. He is pleading with them to contend for the gospel. He's not telling them to compromise. Let me tell you how this word is used in the Bible. Great example. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. It's a beautiful text. He says, I urge you, brethren. He says, warn the unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. And be patient to all men. We see a great example of how this word exhort is to be used. But he didn't just say, ex he didn't just talk about wanting to exhort people. He talked about also adjuring them to contend earnestly for the gospel. Now, when it says contend earnestly for the faith, when you actually examine how this word is used in the Bible, this is it right here, ladies and gentlemen. This is the only time you're going to read contend earnestly in the Bible. Okay, as far as from a Greek uh, perspective, right here in Jude. In fact, you're going to find today, it's, it's a very popular saying, contend earnestly for the faith. I would argue that there's likely um, several books that have been written on this topic. So that's why if you write a book on Jude, you definitely don't want to use contend earnestly because it's likely taken about 500 times, figuratively speaking. But to contend earnestly has a significant meaning. And what I did recently was I was uh, re researching some lexicons to see for a strong definition or a way that I could explain to you all how to interpret what it means to contend earnestly for the faith. Well, that's an important word here. And I pray you guys pay careful attention to detail. I think the best example I've seen was from the Rogers and Rogers lexicon. And I'm just going to paraphrase some of the arguments. But... The Rogers and Rogers lexicon highlighted contend earnestly as to struggle, to exercise great exertion or effort into something. If it's, it's used of athletic games, it refers to the struggle and the effort of the players along with the competition. So you see the connotation it mean, that it has to, to say contend earnestly for the faith. He's not telling people to treat the gospel like it's some trivial matter. He's not telling them treat it and be inclusive with this gospel. No, no, you don't understand. You can't take that perspective when you deal with false teachers. He said contend earnestly for the faith. And the faith here that he speaks of, let's get a proper definition of what he means by the faith. Now remember, the faith is a dative. Okay, dative is simply what you would call an indirect object. Okay, indirect object. So essentially, um, I, I would say one notable theologian, I've really appreciated his work on the emphasis on the faith would be Richard Bauckham. He made some good points and I'll paraphrase, paraphrase those as well. He simply argued that the faith simply means uh, the, the, the content of what was believed. Okay, and it's not uncommon to see emphasis on contend earnestly for the faith. In fact, he made some also some other good points, and he made some good observations on Galatians one twenty three. Now, if you read Galatians one twenty three, there's an excerpt in that passage, which says, "Preacheth the faith." So clearly, preacheth preacheth the faith is certainly tantamount to arguing preaching the gospel. So that's certainly the same context here of what Jude is arguing. He's simply stating the content of the gospel that you profess, the essentials of the Christian gospel that is the power of God into salvation. This is what we should contend earnestly for. And what really helps to, again, strengthen this argument is the fact that he added the adverb. It's a Greek adverb, and it's the word once, which was once which essentially you can interpret it as once for all, especially since the word delivered. Because when you look at that word delivered, the grammar 
actually demonstrates that Paul here is writing about something that God established long ago. That's why he says delivered. And when he says delivered, you have to take a look at delivered from what I call a biblical tradition perspective. I don't want to confuse you. The Bible talks about two different types of traditions. One is terrible and it's heresy. And the other one is from God. Now, if I were to say traditions of men, now we know that's ungodly. The Bible talks about this in Colossians 2. I think it's verse 8 where it says, Parado sinton and thrapon. In other words, the traditions of men, right? In Colossians 2, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceits according to the traditions of men. Traditions of men, ladies and gentlemen, just essentially is referring to imaginations, human superstition. In other words, people that are trying to embrace a position that God has not endorsed. That's a human tradition. But a biblical tradition is just a synonym for saying a biblical truth, God's word. That's what a biblical tradition means. That's why he says, the contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered. Now remember this word delivered. This word delivered essentially just means the teachings of the prophets of old, which was clearly articulated by Christ, taught to the apostles and handed down to the church. That's what it means when it says to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered. In fact, you want to see this word delivered also in the context of scripture? A great example. Remember this word, contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered. You'll see delivered also in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, where he says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, he said, of which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So what do you think that means? Think about how the Old Testament has nothing but typology. There's a lot of typology in the Old Testament that points to Christ, right? And so, of course, there were many prophets of old that testified about the pre-incarnate Christ or about the finished work of Christ or about the Son of Man and Son of God who would uh, assume a human nature and is thus holy God and holy man in one person. We see several Old Testament examples of that. And then we see in the New Testament, Christ testify about himself. Christ taught about his particular redemption in the place of his particular people many times. And what happened? He took this message and he taught it to his apostles. And what did the apostles do? They now brought it to the church. That's why he says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, of what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So that's the context when he says in Jude 3, to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And notice how the gospel is given to God's people. They're called saints. It's not given to all men without exception. Christians proclaim the gospel to all men, but here's the problem. God is not offering the gospel to all men, and uh, all men will definitely not believe in the gospel. I think scripture is very clear that the message of the cross to those who are being saved, it is the power of God, but to those who are perishing, it is foolish. The gospel to those who belong to God, who are called saints, to them it is a, an aroma of life. But to those that are not of God, it's a stench of death. They're going to hate it. On Sunday morning, they're not going to want to hear the gospel. They're going to want to go be entertained. They're going to go and go be around friends. They want to sing music they like. Their gospel is fellowship with friends their gospel is their gimmicks but that's no gospel at all unto the saints is critical unto the saints ladies and gentlemen let me tell you praise god if you believe the gospel because many people are not brought up in homes that hear the gospel i certainly was not i grew up thinking saint is something that the pope had to declare to you you can't think of anything more blasphemous than that to argue that a mere man, some wretched and depraved individual could 
have the audacity to say that he has the power and the authority to declare someone a saint. Ladies and gentlemen, only God can declare someone a saint. So you see, this is why the Pope today is heavily regarded as anti-Christ. If you were to actually look at the word saint in the Bible, I can promise you this right now. It's typically in the Bible translated as holy, as saint, or holy one. This word is used well over 200 times in the Bible. Well over 200 times in the Bible. And guess what? Every single time in Scripture, when the context refers to the creature, I can promise you right now, you will find no example in Scripture where a, a, another sinner is the one that declared them to be saints. God declares who are his saints. So we can call someone a saint only because God has already sanctified them in eternity, monergistically because of Christ alone. So we see that the emphasis on Jude 1 through, uh, verse 3 Again, as I mentioned earlier, we see Paul, I'm sorry, Jude attended to write about the gospel of salvation that all believers have in common or we share collectively. But then again, he had a change of plans and this was due to the intrusion of the false teachers. Now in verse four, let me draw your attention to verse four because now he goes on to describe these false teachers and he also really highlights the purpose of his letter. If, you have, if I could draw your attention to verse 4, he says, For certain men have crept in unaware. Now let's pause here for a moment, okay? Notice how he says, For certain men. Okay, he used what's called an indefinite pronoun. Certain. And he followed it by using the noun anthropi, which is the word men. Now, anthropia is important, right? This is where you get the word anthropology today from, right? You ever know where you get the word anthropology, the study of man? It's right here. Anthropia. This is where you get the, the meaning of the word from. There are certain men. Now, Jude's emphasis here on certain men, he intended to denigrate these false teachers by regarding them as certain men because of their deviant character and practices. Now, I want to give you guys a warning about calling out false teachers. You want to make sure, A, you have your facts straight, okay? And B, if you do have your facts straight, definitely make it known they're false teachers. Now, the reason why I always go to A and say make sure you have your facts straight because you want to be known as a watchman, not as an accuser of the brethren. There's a big difference, okay? So don't just be flippant. Um, don't be reckless, uh, you don't just want to just use that word because somehow it makes you feel bold or it makes you feel uh, tough, so to speak. Uh, but I would argue that you use it from a biblical perspective. If someone is teaching a gospel and not the gospel, if someone is perverting God's uh, holy character, and if someone is teaching to you a different Christ, then the Bible is clear. You are to Again, mark and avoid, expose, have nothing to do with them, reject them, etc. I'm going to get into that in a moment. Now, some people today take the position, oh, no, you shouldn't call anyone out by name. Now, people that do that, I challenge them. Well, how do you respond to all the times that Paul referred to men by name? Now, again, people ask them, well, why didn't you call out people by name? Why did you only say certain men? Now, again, there's context. Just because someone's a false teacher doesn't mean that you absolutely have to call them out by name. There's ways you can call people out. Calling them out by name is one of them, but there's many different ways. If you're asking me why did uh, Jude not specifically call out these false teachers by name, he had his reasons. But I'll tell you right now, sometimes there is a context for not giving someone a platform. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I'm sure you do. Some false teachers crave attention. They love when the spotlight's on them. In fact, they'll take it as a badge of honor and they'll say, I'm being persecuted for my faith, right? So sometimes it's best not to give them that platform. So there's likely a reason why Jude didn't use specific names of who he was referring to. However, the Bible does necessitate there are times when you must 
call out false teachers by name. Let me give you a good example. Didn't Paul in the Bible call out Hymenaeus and Alexander in 1 Timothy 1? Called them out by name and said that he has given them over to Satan. He had no problem calling them out by name. Additionally, if you read scripture, you'll see, didn't Paul also call out um, Phagellus and Hermogenes? And I think that was in 2 Timothy 1. Guess who else Paul called out? Paul called out Hymenaeus again and even called out Philetus. And that's in 2 Timothy 2. Most notably, if you read 2 Timothy 4, he says, Demas has forsaken me and even called out Alexander and says he has done much evil. So look at all the names I just mentioned. And I barely touched the surface. So again, the Bible does necessitate to call out by name at times. Again, but I would address context. When is that time? Now, regarding uh, calling out false teachers by name, there's a reason why you have to call them out by name. Think about false teachers. They're not openly going to admit they're false teachers, are they? Of course not. If you take a look at every denomination, for example, look at the charismatic movement. Do you think any one of these word of faith prosperity teachers, who, by the way, you know what they tend to pray on? They tend to prey on individuals that have uh, a desire or greed, that, that struggle and they want money, right? Or they tend to prey on people that come from nothing. I have a lot of family members that come from Mexico, so they didn't have any money growing up. So the moment they see money and you hear about a preacher talking about money, they get excited over that. Do you actually think one of these popular televangelists are going to come out and say, oh my goodness, you're so gullible. You're actually sending me money and you barely have it so I can be rich and have a plane? You must be so gullible. Do you think any one of these popular prosperity pimps are going to admit that? Of course not. They're going to deceive you because they want your money. Think about today, even in Baptist circles. Do you know how many friends I have? And I can't tell you, it just drives me insane to see some of the books these people like to read. Who are the two popes in the Southern Baptist Convention? Rick Warren and Beth Moore. They're the two popes of the Southern Baptist Convention, right? Um, Rick Warren today, clearly, he's always been unhinged. But even now more than ever that he's now ordaining women as pastors in, the, in his so-called church. And then you have someone like Beth Moore who says things like, God gave me a vision. And in this illustration, she had a Methodist lady, a Catholic lady, an Episcopalian lady. And this is the unity of the vision that God gave me. Oh, she had a vision, all right. I'm not denying that she didn't have a vision. It wasn't from God. Trust me. It was from a false God, but it wasn't from the God. But the point is, do you think these people are going to come out and say, you're so gullible. Why would you spend my money? Why would you spend your money to buy my book at Lifeway when... All I'm doing is just taking your money and, and making you a more biblically illiterate than you've ever been in your life. Because I don't preach exegesis. I don't even know how to interpret the Bible. Do you think they're going to admit that? No. Ladies and gentlemen, I've said this for years. False teachers will never admit they're false teachers. Heretics will never admit they're heretics. The only way you're going to know is if you expose them. And that's the context of Jude. Verse 4, he says, for certain men have crept in unaware. What do you think that means when he says they crept in unaware? This means these people misled others to believe they were Christians, but they were not. He's saying, and if I may put it as an illustration, Jude is basically teaching these individuals that crept in, these are your so-called apologists. These are your doctors of divinity. These are your senior pastors. These are your bastions or your stalwarts of the Christian faith. These are those that are heavily regarded as, as someone who was a defender of the word, someone who was well-read, so to speak. But in reality, these people were counterfeits. These people were deceivers. These people were liars. And that's why it says they crept in. They misled people to believe 
that they were something that they were not. And notice when he says crept in unaware, this language again is very similar to what we read in 2 Peter 2. Now there's two verbs. You have the verb that's used here in um, Jude uh, 1 verse 4 where he says, for certain men have crept in unaware. And you also have the verb that's also used in 2 Peter 2 1. He says, who have privily brought in damnable heresies. Now remember what I said before. Jude and 2 Peter, they both parallel each other. In fact, remember what I said last week, if you were to actually examine Jude 4 and 2 Peter 2, 1, they're both almost identical. Not, not 100%, of course, but they both parallel each other, okay? For example, if you were to take a look at the very beginning of Jude uh, verse 4, for certain men have crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Again, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness, even denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he reads 2 Peter 2, 1. It says, there are false prophets among the people and there are false teachers among you who privily bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them bring upon themselves swift destruction. So again, while these verbs crept in unaware and privily bring in damnable heresies, it's not the same Greek verb, but essentially what the text is teaching is something similar. The false prophets relied on stealth, they relied, they relied on deception, and they relied on manipulation to infiltrate the church because that was their objective, to rob God's people of their gospel riches, and to deceive as many as they possibly could. And this is why Jude gives his warning. Again, in Jude 1.3, and now he goes on to describe these people. Okay, there's certain men who crept in unaware. Now, I believe the Bible is very important here when we're giving the warning about certain men who crept in unaware. Let me give you guys some important biblical tips for application purposes. So that way you guys can uh, protect yourselves from false teachers. I'll tell you some of their practices, so to speak. For example, I think the Bible gives several, several biblical examples on how to identify the marks of a false teacher. I'll share with you several of them. And then I'll tell you how you should respond. Because after all, the text says, for there are certain men who crept in unaware, if you ever experience this, I want you to know how to deal with it. That's what I mean by application. So let me tell you what the, the very first mark of a false teacher, and it's quite simple. I just already addressed it a few moments ago. They want to lead you to believe that they are Christians and they will go to great extent to try to make you believe that. Okay. They're very aggressive on how they do this. And I think the Bible is, 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 very explicit that this is one of their common practices. For example, in Matthew 7, uh, verse 15, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So again, they masquerade as, as being one of you, but in, inside, these people are wolves. These people are violent people. They only seek your harm and never your good. That's the context. Another notable example uh, would be from the Apostle Paul. Remember when Apostle Paul said, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. I believe that's um, um, in, in the, one of his letter to the Corinthians. The Bible also tells us from the Apostle Paul, having a form of godliness but for denying its power, 2 Timothy 3, 5. So we see they masquerade as sheep. They will pretend to be uh, ministers of Christ and they will have the appearance of godliness. But the Bible says that they're wolves. They are basically agents of Satan. And it basically says, but they deny the power of the gospel. The Bible is explicitly clear in how it identifies these people. Another mark of a false teacher is that they are aggressive in their pursuits to lead you away. Trust me, they're aggressive people. 
Additionally, they're not just aggressive. The other thing you need to be mindful of is don't be surprised if they spring up from among you. The Bible warns about that. You'd be shocked. You would be shocked today, ladies and gentlemen, how you think one moment everybody is sound and the next moment someone springs up from among you and is openly denying essentials of the gospel and trying to lead people to believe that same heresy. It happens. You know, I know because that's what we learn from the Bible. Remember when we learned from the Bible how it says, but after my departure, fierce wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. And there will be men who rise up from among you, speak perverse things to lure God's people away. Guess what text that is? Acts 20, verse 29 through 30. So the Bible gives you the warning about that. Another mark of a false teacher is that some of them are gifted orators. Some of them are well-known communicators. These people have what you would call the gift of gab, so to speak. These people know how to convey a message and you could say they've mastered uh, of, a form of trickery. And I'll explain to you the text that, that will clearly point this out. If you're ready to read Romans 16, verse 18. It says, Romans 16, 18 says, for they do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies and their smooth words and flattery speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Deceive the hearts of the simple. Additionally, one thing that you have to be mindful of regarding the false teachers, and this is an important mark, is they love to draw all the attention to themselves and they crave as much contention as they can because they want you to abandon whatever you have believed to be the truth and they want you to they want to draw all the attention to themselves they want to be looked at as the person that has something brand new that no one else has ever thought of right but trust me most of the debates that they'll bring up are some of the most ridiculous and nonsensical things that you'll ever see some of again some of their arguments and i see some of them today they are about as unedifying as you'll ever see. Just ridiculous. And I think the, the proof text for this would be um, Titus 3, verse 9. Titus 3, verse 9 says, But avoid foolish questions, genealogies, and contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. They are unprofitable and vain. And probably the chief mark of a heretic today ladies and gentlemen, is to, among the false teacher, is to deny the doctrine of Christ alone. You're going to find some way to deny the doctrine of Christ alone. And I think the, the precedent for this argument would have to come from 2 John, verse 1. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 2 John 1, verse 9. And I'll just paraphrase. It says, if anyone doesn't have the doctrine of Christ does not belong to God. 2 John 1, verse 9. So as you can see, the beliefs or the marks of the false teachers today, they are, I would call, dangerous, deceptive, and also diabolical. They are dangerous, deceptive, and diabolical. So I will caution you, do not be wise in your own eyes. Don't try to respond to them in your own way. The Bible gives you several examples how to biblically respond to the false teachers. And I'll share with you several texts I know you all are, you are all aware of. Here's one popular one. Paul said, mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine of Christ and avoid them. That was Romans 16, 17. So he says, mark and avoid. Additionally, Paul also taught have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Ephesians 5.11. Paul also said, have no fellowship. I'm sorry. He said, having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people turn away. 2 Timothy 3.5. Titus 3 verse 10. The Bible says, but the heretic man, after the first and second admonition, reject. Additionally, 
I think that right there gives us some good points. So he says to reject. He says to turn away. He says uh, mark and avoid. Have nothing to do with them. I mean, this gives us all the evidence that we need. Additionally, look at 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, um, Beloved, uh, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they're from God. For there are many false apostles that are in the world today. Or there are many antichrists in the world today. Again, even if you go back to 2 John 1, specifically 10 through 11. Again, 2 John 1, 10 through 11. It says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not welcome them in your home or bid them Godspeed. For if you bid them, whoever bids them Godspeed is a partaker of their evil deeds. So the Bible is clear how we should respond to the false teachers. Mark and avoid them. Expose them. Um, have nothing to do with them. Reject them. And again, do not even bid them Godspeed. These are just a few examples. So while in the Bible, Jude had to alter his letter, and to talk about certain men that, that crept in underwear. While many people may have been surprised by this during Jude's time, God was certainly not surprised. Trust me, these people um, are what you would call vessels of wrath. God had ordained these false teachers and everything that they have ever set out to do from eternity. Look at your context. Look at Jude 1.4. He says, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. You see, God was not surprised by this. These false teachers, according to scripture, were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now, this verb is beautiful because the verb that's used there is in a passive voice. And the passive voice means that the wicked were the recipients of God's judgment from eternity. And the fact that it's in the perfect tense means this action was completed long ago and the continuing effects will never cease. That's what it means grammatically. So, of course, these people were marked out long ago, like in eternity long ago. Because God is eternal, therefore his decree is eternal. Remember what the Bible tells us in Proverbs. The Lord made all things, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. God is not shocked by the intrusion of false teachers. Think about people who think God is shocked. They're like, you think God's up in heaven? He's like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? You better warn them. No, God's not shocked by it. We warn others, but God's certainly not shocked by it. God ordained it all. Now, let me tell you something when you examine um, this verb that's used here, ordained who were before of old, ordained to this condemnation. This right here is a passage that clearly deals with eternity. Again, it's in the passive voice, it's in the perfect tense. We're dealing with an action that God has ordained in eternity. So we're dealing with the sovereign decree of God. So essentially what this means is, in eternity, before the creation of the world, not because of foreseen faith or disbelief, but in accordance with his good pleasure, according to his immutable will and to the praise of his glorious grace because of his, his son, God has actively and unconditionally chosen his particular people for heaven, but he has also actively and unconditionally reprobated the non-elect for hell or eternal conscious torment. The Bible is explicitly clear about that. And that's what we read about here in this passage. Who were before of old, ordained to this condemnation. Does the text say who God had passively ordained to condemnation? Who God permitted to be ordained to this condemnation? Does the text say um, that they ordained themselves because of their sins? No. Who were before of old, ordained to this condemnation. Now remember this. The doctrine of double predestination is not popular today among the compromising Calvinist crowd or what I would call the crypto Arminians. And think about what the word crypto means and then the emphasis of Arminian. They claim to be Calvinists, but in reality, they're Arminians. That's the point. 
because they want to teach Arminian doctrines, you have to give ascribe that label to them. Here's what they're going to do. Instead of teaching what the Bible says, because they know double predestination is not a well-liked doctrine, so instead of, be, uh, instead of preaching the gospel like a man and like a gospel preacher, guess what they're going to do? They're going to play defense attorney for God. Well, we better get him off the hook from the charge of, of double predestination because we know many people in the church don't like that. We don't want to ruffle uh, our, some of our Arminian members in the church who, who attend here, and they're okay to attend here just so long as I don't preach on double predestination. After all, I don't want to lose a couple people that are big tithers in the church. That's the position that some people take. And I argue those pastors should resign immediately because if you're not going to preach the truth for what it says, then you have no business being behind the pulpit. Now, here's the argument that they're typically going to say. They're going to take what's called an asymmetrical view of election. So in other words, what they're going to do, since they're going to put on their defense attorney hat, so to speak, they're going to say several things. They're going to say, God has not chosen anyone for hell. That's their first argument. The second argument, they're going to say, well, if God did choose someone for hell, it was because of their sin and not because he decreed it. Okay? Or they're going to say, well, God only passively permitted or allowed them to go to hell. Those are the common arguments that they will typically broach. And I promise you right now, those arguments are not hard to refute. Some of these people that hold this view, they claim to be election preachers. They will say, oh, I preach on election. And some people will defend them and say, oh, you want to hear this person preach on predestination? Oh, my goodness, it's really good. Ephesians 1. Look at them preach on John 6. Oh, they preach on election. Guess what? If you deny the biblical doctrine of reprobation, you don't preach the doctrine of election. You pervert it. You can't sit there and take an asymmetrical view and say um, on this singular decree, okay, that has heads or tails, I'm going to preach only the, the head side of it, but the tail side I'm going to reject. It doesn't work that way, okay? Regardless if you like it or not, if somebody rejects the doctrine of biblical reprobation, which I argue is the most hated doctrine, then you don't preach the doctrine of election like you think. So here's how to refute some of the arguments that people make. So remember this. And here, here, let me try to interact with people so you guys don't think I'm just coming up with straw men. I'm not. I'll give you a good reference. If you guys were to uh, purchase a book, um, it was written by, I believe his name is um, William McDonald. If my memory serves me correctly. He wrote a very thick commentary. And this commentary is, um, is uh, called Believer's Commentary or Bible Believer's Commentary. And I think even John MacArthur endorsed this book. But guess what he says in this book? And I'll quote it. In this book regarding Jude 4, where it says, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Okay. He says in his book, and I quote, he says, no one is chosen to be damned. When men are saved, it is by the sovereign grace of God but when men are finally lost, it is because of their sin, end quote. So you see what this guy taught, right? He basically taught God doesn't send anyone to hell. If someone goes to hell, it's not because of God's decree. It's because of their decisions. And he takes this asymmetrical view where he says, yeah, salvation is all of God, but reprobation, eh, God just passed them by. God just kind of passed them by. That's the argument where people say, you know, that, that God chose out of a fallen humanity. He only chose his elect out of fallen humanity and the rest, he just passed them by. Well, again, that may make for a, a little fiction book, but that's not a biblical argument. Okay, I'll tell you how to refute some of these arguments. So if they say, nowhere in the Bible will you see that God chooses men to be damned. Really? So again, what about Romans? Where it says the purpose of God according to election. Notice that purpose is singular. Underline the emphasis of purpose because it's singular. The purpose of God according to election. And then it says, not of works, but of him that calleth. So when you say God doesn't ordain anyone to hell or God did not decree or actively and unconditionally ordain the salvation, I'm sorry, the reprobation of the wicked, 
to hell, then how do you address that passage where it says, the purpose of God according to election, not of works, but of him that calleth. It's all of God according to scripture. Romans 9, um, specifically if you go through uh, 11 through 13. Now additionally, they're going to say, well, the only reason why men go to hell is because God permits it. God allows it. God lets it happen. Really? So when you read Romans 9 and it says, God will have mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills, does it say he permits to be hardened? Does it say whom he wills he allows to be hardened? No, it says whom he wills he hardens. When it talks about making out of the same lump one vessel for honor and another dishonor, does the text say God allows them to be a, a vessel of honor and another one to be dishonor? There's no permissive, there is no allowing language in there at all. It shows God, again, is the prime agent who has ordained all things whatsoever shall come to pass. The Calminian will also argue, well, the only reason why people go to hell is because of their sins, not because of God's decree. Again, how do you make that argument based on Romans 9? Romans 9 says, before they were born, before they did any good or bad, and then it says, not of works. So how can you make the argument that God sent someone to hell because of their sins if it literally says they were not yet born, they had done neither good or bad, and it says not of works? You know what the text does say? Purpose of God according to election. Does the text say the purpose of what God permits? The purpose of what God allows? No. The purpose of God according to election, not of works, but of him that calleth. It doesn't say but of him that has chosen out of fallen humanity. It doesn't say, but of him that permits it, but of him that allows it. So again, people that come up with these ridiculous arguments, they have no biblical support. So when people today tell me, oh, my pastor preaches on predestination, I'm like, really? I heard his compromising message on, on reprobation. Newsflash, if you don't preach biblical reprobation, then you don't preach on election. Remember the illustration I gave to you before. The fact that the Bible says the purpose of God according to election, it's singular. It's a singular purpose, and that's how you want to examine the doctrine of predestination. Predestination is dealing with that singular decree of God. Now, predestination deals with, simply look at the word, predestination. Where are you going when you die? Are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? What is your final destination? That is a singular decree of God. And therefore, election and reprobation are both equally ultimate in that decree of God. And both election and reprobation are parts of the doctrine of reprobation. That singular decree of double predestination. Therefore, remember that illustration I gave to you before. It's like a coin. There's one coin. There's that singular decree. You have heads or tails. Heads, you deal with active and unconditional uh, election. Tails, active and unconditional reprobation. You can't sit there and deny tails and say, I reject this, ace this symmetrical view of election and reprobation. I believe it's asymmetrical. I believe God actively and unconditionally chose the elect, but he only passed by the rest. That's a way that you want to try to get God off the hook, right? Well, we don't, we don't need to get God off the hook. God's not ashamed of his word. And neither should we be. God's not ashamed of his word. And again, Christians are not either. You preach the Bible for what it explicitly says. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. So again, if a man does not preach on the doctrine of double predestination and they don't hold to active and unconditional election and active and unconditional reprobation, they can say that I am an election preacher all they want. Again, they're just uh, putting themselves in the same category of every other deluded person that wants to identify with whatever else they want to be. It seems to be popular today, right? Again, that's just a simple point that I'll throw out there. But additionally, look at your text. Let's get back into the text. Um, he says, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now, when you're looking at the Bible, when it says this condemnation, notice how we use the demonstrative pronoun, this condemnation. Now, this has confused a lot of people. A lot of people have become vexed over why 
Jude used the demonstrative pronoun, because when you say this, you're typically pointing back to something. Well, if you look back, we don't see anything about condemnation. If you think back, if you look back, you see at the very beginning of Jude, he writes about those that are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ and called and mercy, love and peace be multiplied unto you. We see verse three, when they gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you to exhort you to contend mercy for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Where's the judgment at? So when he says this judgment, what does this mean? Well, I simply think this just refers to the judgment that God has ordained for these uh, wicked false teachers from long ago. And the reason why I take this position, because this text right here, when it says this condemnation is very similar to what we read about in 2 Peter chapter 2, specifically verse 3. So if you were to read 2 Peter 2 verse 3, notice how there's an excerpt in there what says that their judgment lingereth uh, from long ago lingereth not, and their condemnation slumbereth not. Did you see that context, though? Their judgment from long ago lingereth not, and their condemnation slumbereth not. So I think that's what he's referring to when he says, in the context, who were ordained before of old, ordained to this condemnation. He's referring to all the judgment that will come upon them whether it be judgment, condemnation, and then uh, inevitably eternally, uh, eternal conscious torment. I think that's the context of what he refers to. Again, now re again, remember this about the Bible. Um, Jude and 2 Peter, they do parallel each other. So I, def I tend to veer off and go to 2 Peter a little bit because they, they, they definitely parallel. Now again, I don't know whether or not Jude, Jew from 2 Peter, or 2 Peter, Jew from Jude. I'm not 100% certain. I haven't come to that conclusion, but I'm just, it's safe to say they parallel. Now, lastly, look what else we're going to call out here. He describes these false teachers as ungodly, lasciviousness, and Christ deniers. Look at your context. He says, for there are certain men who crept in, who were before of old, ordained to this condemnation. And he says, they are ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness even denying the only Lord God and Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's talk real, real quickly here about the emphasis on ungodly. Now the ungodly that's used here in the Bible, now remember this and I don't want you to be vexed over this. Ungodly has context. There are some passages in the Bible where ungodly does refer to God's people prior to being declared righteous, prior to the regeneration, prior to their conversion. For example, if you were to read uh, Romans 5, it talks about Christ died for the ungodly. However, depending on the context, there are other passages which clearly reveal that ungodly is referring to those that will always be ungodly. They will never be declared righteous, and they would be regarded as your reprobate or your non-elect. Okay, and believe it or not, the emphasis on ungodly here that he emphasizes simply means that these here are your poster children for Satan. These here are your offspring from hell. These people are agents of the devil. And that's what he's warning about when he says these ungodly. Ungodly. Now, I argue the type of people that he's describing here are the same type of people that God wiped off the earth during that worldwide flood. Now look at the language of the Bible, the fact that he emphasizes here in Jude 4, ungodly men, ungodly men. You'll see the same language of ungodly also used in 2 Peter 2, 5, where it says, God spared not the world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. And he says, but he brought the flood on the world of the ungodly. You see how ungodly is used there as well? referring to the people that God wiped off the face of the earth, and yet he only spared those few, the eight, including Noah. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Jude is not clueless as to what this word godless means. In fact, one thing you'll notice if you hear someone speak a lot on a topic, let's say you work for an employer and you have a boss, you'll find out your, your boss has something that they like to say a lot. 
I say something sometimes, sometimes too much. It sometimes becomes habit. Okay, I, I'm, I know I do that probably quite a bit too. I've had several leaders uh, throughout my 20 years in the military who did the same thing. Jude was well accustomed to this word ungodly because he was extremely um, redundant with this word. For example, look at verse 15 of your text. He talks about executing judgment upon all to convince those who are ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed. And those words, which these ungodly sinners have spoken. See how many times he used the word ungodly? Additionally, he also used it in verse 18. To describe, if I may just preface, in verse 18, he talks about the, the scoffers who come in the last time, who walk according to their own ungodly lusts. So you see the word ungodly is certain a word he wasn't uh, unaware of. He certainly was well accustomed to this word because he used it often here in his own work. Next, he goes on to describe them not only as ungodly, he says they turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now, let's talk about this word. This is a big word right here, okay? Lasciviousness. You don't hear it in common conversations today, do you? Well, that person is a lascivious person. No, it's typically, you know, a language that you typically hear at church, right? Lascivious. Typically King James Version language, right? Um, but when you examine that word lascivious, um, you'll see that it's typically translated in the Bible as filthiness it's translated as lasciviousness and i think it's even translated as wantonness in the bible okay essentially what the author is talking about is something that is a vile practice and i believe the context is referring to sexual immorality i think that's the context and i'll state my point uh in a moment but when jude emphasized they turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. The first thing I need you to know about this word lasciviousness is that it is a work of the flesh. It is a work of the flesh. You need to memorize those works of the flesh that are in the Bible because they certainly would be described as ungodly practices. The works of the flesh, according to the Apostle Paul, he called them adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, uh, sedition, heresy, envying, murdering, drunkenness, reviling. Again, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. It's a work of the flesh. Now I want to give you a lexical meaning of it to help you, to help um, give kind of like an icebreaker, so to speak, to um, the point that I'm getting ready to bring up regarding the word lascivious. I was reading um, the BDAG lexicon, and the BDAG lexicon basically described the emphasis here on turning the grace of our God into lascivious. This basically means people who basically misinterpret, or I would argue, and again, I'll preface some of the arguments from the book, they misinterpret God's divine goodness, again, and they twist it and they think that they can disregard God and do whatever they want, essentially. Now, I like that and for a, for a reason, and I'm going, to share with you my, I'm going to share with you my position and then share with you what I believe is the biblical justification. What I believe what he means here when he says they turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness, I believe what this means is that that there were certain people that gave lip service to God's grace. But then they took this grace and they twisted it to imply that they could do whatever they want or commit any sexual immoral practice because after all, God gave us grace. I believe that is the context of what he means by turning the grace of our God um, into lasciviousness. This is not uncommon in the Bible. For Paul to expose other people that held to a similar view. Remember Paul in Romans 6 when he says, what should we say then? Since, since, uh, since uh, we are under grace, shall we continue to sin that, that, that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. But these false teachers would argue, absolutely. They thought that we are under grace and, no, and that we should uh, no, no longer sin that grace may abound that we should continue to sin that grace may abound. 
they would say, absolutely, we could do that. Because these people were delusional. They were, before of old, ordained to this condemnation. So, again, the point is, I believe, Jude is describing individuals that perverted the grace of God, and they would argue something like this. Well, after all, God is grace. And because he gives us grace, we can go and commit any sexual immoral practice we want, and it's perfectly justifiable, justifiable before God because he is grace. Again, I think that's the position that I would take, and I'll tell you why. I think the context gives it away. Here's why I take this position. Um, take a look at verse 7. Notice how we mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah. What do you think took place at Sodom and Gomorrah? People wanting to do unnatural things. People committing ungodly practices. I don't need to elaborate on what they did. You all know. Look at what it says in verse 8 of Jude 1. It talks about defiling the flesh. So you have in verse 7, it emphasizes Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 8 of Jude, it talks about defiling the flesh. So right here, the context clearly suggests or indicates that is what Jude is referring to. Additionally, remember this, you cannot look at Jude without also emphasizing 2 Peter. Because remember, whether or not, I'm not, I don't know whether or not Jude drew from 2 Peter or 2 Peter drew from Jude. Again, one thing is certain is that both of them parallel. Look at the parallelisms that come from 2 Peter. Same thing. Look at 2 Peter 2.6. Sodom and Gomorrah is mentioned. What took place at Sodom and Gomorrah? People doing unnatural things. People committing very sinful, uh, sexual, immoral practices. Look at 2 Peter 2 uh, verse 7. It says, delivered just Lot, who was vexed with the lascivious or filthy conversations of the wicked. Again, what do you think that's referring to? Then take a look at 2 Peter 2.18. 2 Peter 2.18, since again, Jude, 2 Jude and Peter, and, and Peter parallel each other. If you read 2 Peter 2.18, it even says in there that they allure through the lust of the flesh through much lasciviousness or wantonness. So again, I think the context suggests that there were people that gave lip service to grace, but they would pervert this grace and disregard God and say, we can do whatever we want because God is grace. So they went and practiced all kinds of sexual immoral things. I think that is what the context suggests. Additionally, notice the last part where it says, even denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We're on the very last point here, okay? Even denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you uh, to be alert about something here. The fact that he says Lord twice. Lord God and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at the Greek text, they're not the same word. Okay, I can promise you right now they're not the same word. The first one he says, Vesputin Theon, Lord God. And the second one he says, um, Kirion Isun Christon. So we have Vespotin and Kirion. Two different Greek words, but in your English it reads the same. Lord God and Lord Jesus Christ. So it's important to remember that. Now, when you look at the first one where it says Vespotin, that's where you get the English word despot. You ever heard the word despot today? Most atheists today will say, ah, oh, never believe in the God of the Bible. That's a tyrannical despot who who has bears come out of the woods and kill children, that's a despot. They love to use that term, despot. Well, this right here, you look at the word despotin. This right here is Lord God. So what does the word despotin mean? Now, this word is also used in 2 Peter 2.1, even denying the Lord, despotin, who bought them. Okay? So remember that. So this is the similarity between 2 Peter and also Jude. A lot of similarity. Again, they parallel each other. So, Vespotin, uh, let me tell you what it means, and I'll share with you a good text of where you're going to see this Greek word used. If you look at Acts 4, in Acts 4, remember that text where it says, and, um, and after these things took place, they lifted up their voice together in one accord, and what did they say? Lord, Vespota, Lord, thou art God. And you created the 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 heaven 
and the earth and the seas and all that's within it. I think that's X424. I could be wrong. Um, X4, somewhere in X4. It could be 24. Um, but the fact that that U word is user, so therefore, to take a look at the word despotin, that word simply refers to God's absolute sovereignty over all things whatsoever. Now, here's, now here is something that you need to be mindful of because I believe a lot of old school scholars have got this wrong, even people that I've appreciated. Guess what, guess what John Gill says here? John Gill takes the view, very similar to what a lot of people do. Um, they're going to say if you read passages like, like 2 Peter 2, 1, even denying the Lord who bought them, Vespotin, Gill and many others like him would argue that um, Vespotin uh, does not design Christ but refers to the Father. A lot of people will say that the title Vespotin never refers to Christ, but it always refers to the Father. That's a position that John Gill held, and I have to disagree. Again, I have to disagree because, again, regardless of who our popular, uh, uh, who our favorite uh, go-to theologian or minister, we judge all things by Scripture, not by popularity. Okay, you have to challenge things when there is an exegetical argument that you need to make. And here's an argument that I would make. Um, I would argue, so people when read, when they read uh, Jude 1.4, and it says, even denying the only Lord God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, people will say, the Lord God, Vespotin Theon, that refers to the Father. And where it says, Kirion Isun Christon, the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to say that refers to, to the Son. So they're going to say these false teachers were denying the Father and the Son. But I disagree with that interpretation. I think the context is referring, they're denying the Son, who is Lord God and Lord Christ. That's the context. And I'll share with you the reason why I hold to this position. Okay, it's based on the grammar. You have to remember something about rules. When you deal with grammatical rules, remember this. There's always exception to rules. However, context must determine. And rules are in place when you're interpreting the Bible because that helps you have good order and discipline so you don't just slavishly assume the Bible says something without examining the exegesis or without exegeting the text for yourself. That's the point. You don't just want to be a puppet where you're just, you know, somebody tells you something you're like, oh, that becomes the truth. Examine it from the Bible. Examine it for yourself. Now, if you look at the text, notice how Vespotin Theon, you have the article that precedes it. So grammatically it says the Lord God. And then you have that conjunction. You have what's called the copulative. Again, which is simply just, it's just connecting both nouns. And notice how Lord God and Lord Christ, notice how both of these have the same case. And what I mean by the same case is both of them are accusative. An accusative just simply refers to the object. Remember, your nominative is your subject, your accusative is your object. And then when you get to Lord Jesus Christ, there's no article. Ladies and gentlemen, I promise you right now, if you examine the original you will not see the article. It doesn't say the Lord God and the Lord Christ. Now, if that were the case, now we're referring to the Father and the Son. But there's no article for Lord Christ. So according to the Granville Sharp rule, this basically tells us that both nouns that are used of the same case, since they're connected by the conjunction, that both nouns are synonymous or used interchangeably. Again, look at the Greek grammar beyond the basics. Typically, it's uh, page 270 through 290. If you have one, it, it clearly lays out the principles for understanding, you know, this grammatical rule. Therefore, when you're reading the passage, the text is teaching that the false teachers denied the Son, who is Lord God and Lord Christ. This is not uncommon language in the Bible. He's called Lord God and Lord Christ. What was the what, what was the what was it that the disciple what was it that he said to Christ after he had appeared to him after his resurrection? He said, "My Lord, my God." Again, this is nothing new in the Bible. Okay? So again, the point is these false teachers were ungodly, they were lascivious, and these people denied the full divinity of the Son. These people were denying that the Son had assumed a human nature or they were denying the hypostatic union. 
They were denying his person and his work. They didn't believe in his completed saving and effectual work on behalf of the elect. They denied the Son, who again is both God and Savior. And that's why he wrote, again, that's why he had to alter his letter. Initially, again, Jude wanted to write a letter talking about the gospel of salvation that all believers embrace collectively. But instead, he had to modify it to warn them about certain people that these intruders that crept into the church seeking to pervert gospel doctrines and to lead people away from the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the study. But again, my goal when I teach expositionally, again, is to go through verse by verse, help you understand everything in these texts, okay? And if, if you walk away not understanding what the text means, then I haven't done my job. So I hope today you were edified by uh, the study in Jude 1, verse 3 through 4. Next week, join me, because I'm going to continue this verse by verse study in Jude, and then move on to the next three verses, okay? So I pray you'll join me. Let's pray and then we'll go to the Psalter. Your, your gospel is everything to us, Lord. I pray we would always have it in the back of our mind, Lord, that, that your gospel is central to everything. We judge by the gospel alone. We live by the gospel alone. And we will die by the gospel alone. Keep us faithful and focused, Lord, during these times of, of great apostasy. We pray all this in the name of our, of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen.